If you have your Bibles, I'd like to flip to the Old Testament. We're going to be exploring the book of Nehemiah. We're going to start in chapter 4. And uh, we're going to jump around a little bit. We love, as a people, the idea of freedom. We love it. The idea that ain't nobody going to hold me down. Is, is that going to? Yeah. Okay. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. Salud. Salud. We love the idea of freedom. We love the idea that nobody can hold us down. You know, we're our own people. Uh, when I was in China, China loves to sell American stuff. They love to sell it, man. When we got to China, we found University of Arizona t-shirts in stores in, in China. I'm like, do you, uh, tell me one person that goes to U of A. I mean, come on, man. Where is that university located? Uh, they have Pink Floyd t-shirts, which is British, but you get the point. Well, they love Western stuff, and, and I used to walk around, and we would kind of mockingly go, tell me one song, one album name. Uh, but one of the things that they love to sell, which made us laugh hysterically, is these American shirts that say, like, USA Freedom. <laughs> and, and I'm like, in China, right? Communist China, it's, there's not a less free place on the planet. And I freed them on everybody's t-shirts. But in the idea of freedom, I'm imagining that free, like, you look at an astronaut, right? Okay. They're out in space. They're drifting away from the space station. They're tethered with a little umbilical. They're like, wow, look, I'm so free. I'm looking at the cosmos. I'm looking at the stars. Oh, it's so great. I'm so free. But what if he said... I'm not free enough. What about all, this, all the constraints of this suit? This is terrible. And he just unbuckled everything and got out of the suit. Because he didn't appreciate the boundaries. The truth is, freedom only functions within boundaries. There has to be a wall for us to be free. There have to be boundaries to define our space. When I used to act in theater, <clears throat> my director would always tell me, play the space, right? Play the space, we have a set, play the space. But that doesn't mean that I'm out there acting in the eighth row of the audience. There are still boundaries. I'm within the four walls of the stage. In fact, <clears throat> in theater, they call the front of the stage the fourth wall. Because there are three walls. This is the fourth wall. This is the wall you cannot cross. Our whole world exists on the stage. We are totally free to do whatever we want to on the stage. We need boundaries to protect us from the dangers of our sinful world. The truth is sometimes those barriers get broken down, don't they? Sometimes the trust we have in people is destroyed and we're exposed to problems and troubles and difficulties that was never God's intention and we never should have been exposed to. What do we do then? I want to preach to you a sermon that I've entitled Repairing the Breaches. Nehemiah chapter 4, beginning in verse 6. So we built the wall. And the wall was joined together to about half its height, because the people had a mind to work. But when Sanballat and Tobiah and the Arabs and the Ammonites and the Ashdites and the Ashdodites heard that the repairing of the walls of Jerusalem was going forward and that the breaches were beginning to be closed, they were very angry. And they plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and to cause confusion. 
We prayed to our God and set a guard as protection against them day and night. So we labored at the work, and half of them held spears from the break of dawn until the stars came out. I also said that the people at, to the people at that time, let every man and his servant pass the night within Jerusalem, that they may be a guard for us by night and may labor by day. So neither I nor my brothers nor my servants nor the men of the guard who followed me, none of us took off our clothes and each kept a weapon in his right hand. Let's talk about the damage. In Nehemiah chapter 1, Nehemiah is the king's cupbearer in Babylon. And a friend of his comes back from Jerusalem and brings a terrible report. It says in verse 2, that Hanani, one of my brothers, came with certain men from Judah. I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped, who had survived the exile, concerning Jerusalem. They said to me, the remnant is there. In the province who have survived the exile, they're in great trouble and shame because the wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are destroyed with fire. Nehemiah petitions to the king and the king gives him not just permission, but everything that he would need to rebuild the wall. And Nehemiah leaves Persia to rebuild the walls around Jerusalem because the walls were broken down. Now what's interesting here is the walls were broken down because Persia had destroyed the city. This meant that Jerusalem and the people that remained there could be easily victimized by the surrounding enemies. There were no walls. God lays down boundaries as a system of, of protection from things outside and to contain things inside. He lays down boundaries in our behavior. The Ten Commandments are divided into two groups. The first four deal with our relationship to God. The last six, 60% of the Ten Commandments deal with our relationship with other people. These are boundaries we should not cross. Honor your father and mother is commandment number five. But what if your father and mother violate you? What if your children refuse to honor you? Commandment number six, do not murder. Taking the life of an innocent, even if it's legal, is murder. I am not afraid to say that abortion is murder. Commandment number seven, do not commit adultery. But what happens when you suffer a violation? What happens when your husband, your wife, your coworker violates you, violates your trust? Commandment number eight, do not steal. What happens when you're stolen from? Commandment number nine, do not lie about your neighbor. This includes throwing someone under the bus. But what happens when you're thrown under the bus? Do not covet is the last of the commandments. And the interesting thing about coveting, people go, I used to have, people say this all the time, man. We'd be driving down the street and I'd see a dude in a Bronco and I'd be like, And they'd be like, don't cut it, bro. <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> and it always bothered me because, like, what, I'm not allowed to want anything? Like, I'm not allowed to see something and appreciate anything? So I looked it up, and that word covet is interesting because that word covet is not wanting something like that. It's wanting that because that person doesn't deserve it. I don't want a thing, I want your thing. Which is why, in the Bible it says, don't covet your neighbor's donkey, don't covet your neighbor's wife, don't covet your neighbor's right? These are all singular things. Only one person can possess them at a time. It's wanting that because they don't deserve it. It should have been ours. Now, many of us have suffered from one, at least one, or more 
of these violations, the breaches have been broken down. Or the, the walls have been broken down. There are holes in the walls that surround our life. Some of us suffer at the hands of other people. Other people make decisions and it victimizes us. Some people suffer at our own hands. And we have to stand back and realize that we are the only one responsible for the bad things that are happening to us. Each of these things represents a break in the walls that God established for our protection. So what do we do when we're violated? We have to find a way to move beyond those violations. We have to find a way. And sometimes the only way out is through. We just have to walk it. With God's help, then we have to start rebuilding the walls. Because these breaks in the walls can expose us to attacks that we would not have normally faced. If we have been stolen from, we must simply say, well, I will not steal. If we have been violated, we have to say, I will not violate. And we repair the breaches in the walls in this manner. Ezekiel chapter 22, verses 6 through 12 says, Look at the princes of Israel. Each one has used his power to shed blood in you. In you they have made light of their fathers and mothers. In your midst they have oppressed the stranger. They have mistreated the fatherless and the widow. You have despised my holy things and profaned my Sabbath. In you are men who slander and cause bloodshed. In you are those who eat on the mountains, meaning things sacrificed to idols. In your midst they commit lewdness. In your in you men unco uh, in you men uncover their father's nakedness. In you they violate women who are set apart during their impurity. One commits an abomination with his neighbor's wife. Another lewdly defiles his daughter-in-law. Another violates his sister, his father's daughter. In you, they take bribes to shed blood. You are take usury and increase. You have made profit from your neighbors by extortion, and you have forgotten me, says the Lord. So I sought for a man among them. This is verse 30 who would make a wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land that I would not destroy it, but I found no one. Bad things happen all the time in life. Will we stand in the gap? Will we repair the walls Will we repair the breaches? Let's talk about the resistance once we set to that work. Once we decide that we're going to repair the walls around our own life, we're going to repair the walls in our families, we're going to repair the walls in our country, once we set to that work, we're going to face resistance. Because bullies don't like it when you start to learn to fight back, when you're defending. Bullies don't like that. So there will always be resistance. Whenever we set to the work of rebuilding boundaries, it's going to come. I've seen people who suffered these violations and then they fall into all kinds of sin. They face addictions with drugs, alcohol, pornography, sex. All of these things happen because they're trying to self-medicate. They're trying to not repair the holes in the wall around their life. They're just trying to forget about the holes. They suddenly feel that they have no value. They feel that there's no value in their life if they're not earning enough money, if someone isn't paying attention to them, if they're not the center of attention. They feel like they're worthless. Their life is meaningless if they're not the most successful person in the room. 
This will lead to all kinds of compromises and sins to try and fill the gaps that are in the walls of their life. But the problem is, is they're trying to fill a God-shaped hole with things. We have to have God's help to, fulfill, to fill these breaches in our life. Then I've seen other people. Massive holes in the walls around their life. Massive breaches in trust. Massive violations in their history. And they make one simple decision. They give their life to Jesus. I've seen them instantly restored. Instantly begin to establish healthy boundaries about themselves. And Jesus begins to help them rebuild their life when suddenly that ex-girlfriend who hasn't spoken to you in a year and a half calls you up and says, Hey baby, what's up? How you doing? I haven't heard from you in like forever. You walk into a place, your old drug dealer's there. Hey! These are not coincidental occurrences. This is opposition. This is opposition to you rebuilding your life, to Jesus helping you. Nehemiah chapter 4, our key verse says, When Sanballat and Tobiah and the Arabs and the Ammonites and the Ashdodites heard that the repairing of the walls of Jerusalem was going forward and the breaches were beginning to be closed, what was their response? They were very angry. The goal of the devil is always the same. Always the same. When the work of the Lord begins, it doesn't matter if the work in your life will only affect your life. If the work in your life will affect your whole family, if the work in your life will affect the whole city, or if the work in your life will affect the entire nation or the world. It doesn't matter to the devil. When the work of the Lord begins in your life, the devil will begin to plot how he can confuse it. He wants to bring confusion against you. And the easiest way to bring confusion is emotional. We have six basic human emotions. Anger, happiness, surprise, disgust, sadness, and fear. The problem with our emotions is that, number one, they're easily manipulated. And number two, they're liars. <laughs> our emotions are not the truth. What we are feeling is not the truth. There are moments, there have been moments in this church where I am standing here preaching and I literally feel like everything I say is falling out of my mouth, hitting the pulpit, rolling onto the floor. And like, like everyone here is sitting there going, oh, I just wish you'd shut up. <laughs> then we get to altar call and the whole church responds. And I go, hey, God, you were doing something. Because my feelings are not the truth. When I was in China, I wrote Pastor Warner an email. And I was vexed. I was vexed. And I opened the email with the line, this is not a resignation letter. <laughs> I just have to vent. And I just puked on Pastor Warner that we had built this church like five times because every spring break we would lose, ever, like a, the spring festival in January, we would lose everyone for a month. It was me and Sarah and the kids. And that was it. That was the whole church. We built this church up to like 35 people and then it's the four of us for a month as everyone's gone. And then... Three people would come back. And we'd build it up to like 35 people and be like, yeah, and then everyone would leave and it's the four of us in January. Dude, what the heck, man? Two years of this, I emailed Pastor Warner and I just puke my feelings on him. I gave him all my feels. He responded, I wonder how Hudson Taylor would feel. 
He labored in China for 15 years before he saw his first convert. I'm, just, I'm shutting up now. Because my feelings are not the truth. We came back to America, and I still have people contacting us from China saying, thank you so much for coming. You changed our lives. Because my feelings are not the truth. Take the example that I just gave of the old boyfriend or girlfriend calling. The truth is, that dude's a jerk. He left you a year ago. He hasn't called you or texted you that entire time. If he was a great dude, he'd be in church right now. Right? If he was a great dude, he would have married you. If it was a great girl, she would have married you. They'd be serving God with you. They're asking your pastor for a good time to get married. The truth is, people like this are sinners. They're sinners. And they're only calling you for one reason. Your drug dealer is only happy to see you for one reason. People always tell me, oh, you're a pastor, man. I got problems with the church. And I'm like, what problem do you have with the church? Man, church only wants your money. Like, you shop at McDonald's, right? Like, you, you go to Walmart? They only want your money. Truth is, your drug dealer only wants your money. They don't care about you. He cares about the fact that you're an income. The emotion of surprise, happiness, and a little fear mix inside us to become excitement. And all these endorphins start running around in our head. Emotions make us deaf when our brain goes, this is a big mistake. <laughs> and our brain is telling us, the Holy Spirit is nudging us, don't do this, it's a mistake. But all those endorphins make us stupid. But it feels so good. Shut up, feelings. You're liars. <laughs> Having boundaries protects us from feelings because boundaries are laws, right? I feel like I'm running late. I feel like I'm in a hurry. The speed limit says 35 and the cop on the corner under the sign reminds me that he's serious. So it doesn't matter what I'm feeling, I do 35. Now I may be in the car going, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on while I'm doing 35. But boundaries saying, if this, then that, is important to keeping us free and safe from our feelings. Because here's the problem. I used to teach firearms classes. And I used to teach concealed carry permit classes. Arizona. And if you're going to adopt the lifestyle of carrying a gun all the time, you have to understand that the moment that everything is going wrong around you is not the moment to start trying to make decisions as to whether or not this is the appropriate moment to draw that weapon. Because your emotions are liars. And when the only tool you have is a hammer, every problem starts to look like a nail. So I would teach people what you need to do is in totally non-emotional situations, sitting on the couch on an idle Thursday afternoon at 2 p.m., you need to start thinking about, if I'm in a parking lot and I hear gunfire, what am I going to do? I'm going to leave. <laughs> you need to just start thinking about those things and making those decisions ahead of time. Because then the emotion of the moment is there, you already know what you're going to do. You turn and you do what you're going to do. You've already made that decision. So stopping and saying, if I am tempted with my ex-dealer, if I am tempted with drugs or alcohol, I am going to leave. Setting that now, that boundary, protects you from the feelings of the moment. 
Because in the moment, the feelings can be overwhelming. Let's look at the reason. The reason we need to rebuild the breaches. I want to look briefly at one of the greatest violations of the Bible. <laughs> Luke chapter 22 outlines what I think is probably the greatest betrayal in the entire Bible. Luke tells us about a man who walked with Jesus and he had a single moment when he gave in to all of his emotions. He had no preformed plan, he had no boundaries. All of the boundaries that he had established were stripped to the foundations. Like Jesus prophesied about the temple, not one stone of this man's boundaries was left upon the other. Let's read it. Luke chapter 22, verses 54 to 62. And they seized him and led him away, bringing him to the high priest's house. And Peter followed at a distance. And when they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat down among them. Then a servant girl, seeing him as he sat down in the light and looking closely at him, said, Hey, this guy was also with him. But he denied it and said, Woman, I don't know him. A little later, someone else saw him and said, Hey, you're one of them. And Peter said, Man, I am not. And after an interval of about an hour, still another insisted, saying, Certainly this dude was there with him, because he's also a Galilean. But Peter said, Man, I don't know what you're talking about. And immediately, while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And Peter remembered what Jesus had said. How he had said to him, before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. He ran away and wept bitterly. You know, years ago, we tried a diet to try and do like a metabolic reset. Called the Whole 30. It's 30 days of extremely clean eating. You eat meat, fruits, vegetables. That's it. For 30 days. Now the book that we read said that that might not be enough to heal your body. You may need to do a whole 60. One lady didn't even start to feel better until she had eaten well for 120 days. If you learn a new sport, you might become proficient in a few months, but it will take you years to master it. If there's very little progress, uh, there's very little progress that you can make only in two months of commitment to anything. If you take 60 days to do anything, you're probably not gonna get very good at it. This is important to understand. I want you to see that even the most extreme physical workout routines say that you should be willing to commit at least 90 days or more if you want to see any results at all. Now I say this because only two months after this event, Peter preaches the first sermon of the modern church with no notes. He quotes the Old Testament three times with clarity and power and fearlessly declares Jesus to a crowd of thousands of people and three thousand people were added to the church that morning. I say that because this is not a moment of Peter's 60 days of commitment. Right? This wasn't the 60 day prayer ritual. I've got my, my 60 day uh, uh, Bible reading plan and I'm going to, oh yeah, now I'm a mighty preacher. That was not what happened. This was a miracle. Nothing happens in 60 days. This was a miracle. It started on Easter morning. When the angel at Jesus' empty tomb told the women, he is risen, and then says some of the most powerful and merciful words in the entire Bible, go tell the disciples and Peter that he goes ahead of you into Galilee and we'll see him there. Go tell the disciples and Peter? 
Jesus reached out to Peter and said, I know that the walls are broken down, Peter. I know that you, you everything that you thought was your personality has been stripped to its foundations. I know that your life is in ruins. Come to me. Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 to 30. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and I will find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy, and my burden is light. There's an old Jewish tradition in the Talmud that says that while Jesus was a carpenter here on earth, that no one was able to make a yoke for oxen the way he was. That people would come from other countries and Jesus could just look at your animals and make perfect yokes for them so they didn't rub, chafe the animal. It's an old Jewish tradition. I don't know how true it is. We'll ask him. But Jesus calls us to come to him because he's the only one that can rebuild our broken lives, that can give us rest, that can give us peace. Psalms 127 says, Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain that build it. Unless the Lord watches over a city, the watchman stays awake in vain. Rebuilding the walls in our life is not something that's going to take 30 days, 60 days, or 90 days of clean eating and Bible study. It's a miracle. It's a miracle of God. This isn't the result of a program. It's the result of a miracle. Ephesians chapter 2 says, For grace you have been saved through faith. This is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship. We're his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Through God's help and only by God's help can we overcome the violations in our past. Both the violations that were committed against us, the ones that we committed against ourselves, and the ones that we committed against other people. Colossians chapter 3 says, Bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive we have to find a way to move past those violations and let Jesus repair those breaches. Reset those boundaries. And everything starts with forgiveness. First, we have to forgive the people who wronged us. Then we have to forgive ourselves for hating them. Then we have to forgive ourselves for violating other people. God can and God will repair the breaches in our lives if we let him. Amen? Amen. Let's bow our heads. Oh, thank you, Jesus. God is so good. If you're here and you've never received Jesus Christ, you've never received the forgiveness of sins, you're here and you say, Pastor, you're talking about these violations of the past, heartbreaks, betrayals. I have suffered these. There are massive holes in the walls of my life, massive holes in the boundaries that God set for my protection. I want to repent of my sins so that Jesus can start to help me repair those walls. If that's you, I want you to raise your hand. Perhaps you are here and you once knew the love of God. You've been forgiven, but you're struggling. 
Those violations have piled up. You're not sure if you can forgive yourself. You're not sure if you can forgive the person who's violated you. You're not sure. You're just not sure. But you need forgiveness this evening. God is married to the backslider. God wants to help you. This in no way invalidates your pain. Your pain is real. The betrayal is real. This isn't some simple thing. Oh, just forgive them. I understand. God understands. And he wants to help you. Raise your hand this evening. One more call before we change the order of the service. Amen. If you're here and you're a Christian, and you say, Pastor, the walls of my life are broken down. Like Peter, I've been stripped to the foundations. Jesus says, come to me and I will give you rest. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. Come to me. Let Jesus help you repair the breaches. Let Jesus help you rebuild the walls around your life and set those boundaries in place by the power of the Holy Spirit. Let's sing this song. Let's all stand tonight. We're going to sing this song. These altars are open.